This episode is sponsored in part by Privacy. It's like a burner phone for credit cards. To sign up for free and get a $5 credit, just go to privacy.com slash GOG. That's $5 free to spend anywhere by just signing up. Privacy.com slash GOG. Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Guten Morgen. Hello. It is very early today. Yes, we are recording at uh, top of the morning. Top of the morning to you. Uh, my laptop in the other room is updating to Mojave, so I will have an update on that next week. From what I've heard, it's actually not bad. I uh, updated yesterday. How do you like it? I like it. I'm running in dark mode, which, uh, you know, when I was... <laughs> When I was the only younger, reason I wanted it. <laughs> when I was younger, I would have done it for the look and because I would have felt cool. <laughs> now that I'm older, yeah. I'm doing it for eye strain. It's quite nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, it was a relatively painless update. Nothing went wrong. Uh, everything seems to be working pretty well. Uh, you know, they they drop a few more apps. I don't need Apple News. I don't care. So I've already like pulled that off my drop bar and things like that, that nature. But uh, uh-huh. it's quick. Uh, dark mode is pretty nice. I, I wish I'm hoping I can do some tweaks to it because I don't care for some of the color scheme that they're using. I probably won't be able to because, you know, the days of being able to really customize uh, our systems are long gone. But uh, overall, I like it. Yeah, we we were long past the days of res edit and things yes. like that. I miss <laughs> res edit so much. Me too. That was so much fun back then. We wasted so many days and weeks customizing <laughs> our Macs back then, but it was so much fun. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to to dark mode because it's I've got almost all of my apps have a dark mode. Yeah. Already. So now it'll be nice to have it like unified in the system. So we'll we'll follow up with that soon. And I got my aura ring. Okay. Finally, I did my first sleep with it last night and uh it's awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome because now I don't have to wear my watch when I go to bed and the data is way better than on the app, Apple watch, even okay. with the sleep tracker app. Mm-hmm. It's so much better. So I'm, I'm looking forward to being like able to have some time with it until the next show and do a full deep dive on it. And, well, interesting. Uh, I mean, if Apple is all in on health, does that mean we're going to be getting an Apple ring at some point? Because it's probably a better way to track. Nah, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. The eye ring, but uh, better than an O ring, I guess. Uh, but it, yeah, it uh, it feels comfortable. It's really light and uh, it's very stylish. Most men fear putting the ring on the finger, but Jason leaps forward. Yeah, well, I put it on my right hand, so <laughs> I'm not married yet. Although you wear your wedding ring on your right hand. I do. I do. Um, my dad did as well. And it's just kind of a thing that my family apparently does. So a bunch of cheaters for when you go out at the bar. Like, hey, I'm not married. <laughs> yeah, that's my modus operandi. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With all that time I have not changing diapers, I'm out there chasing tail. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> Right. All right. <clears throat> so we got a bit of Amazon follow up. Uh, Recode apparently listened to us and agrees with us. They did a nice long article about how as as Amazon is trying to push Alexa into every corner of our lives, there is nary a thought of privacy or security in these systems, which is very important. Now, they make a good point. Uh, people just don't seem to care, which mm-hmm. we've also mentioned a lot. Uh, yep. But we should care because these things are pretty easy to hack. They're pretty we're putting more and more control of our lives and our house on these things and there is zero zero security uh they do point out that uh amazon is not dumb uh if people cared they'd be addressing it people don't seem to care and they're kind of saying what uh we kind of know we live in a world now where we can't expect our these companies to take care of it for us we have to push them to do it uh so they're basically saying uh, if you are an amazon customer and you're in the ecosystem you need to push amazon to get security on these things which is <laughs> okay who am i going to call jeff bezos <laughs> yeah, call directly jeff. like there's no fucking customer service anywhere so what am i supposed to do here well, the thing is, I mean, we've only had a few issues with these things in the wild with with Amazon. So I think the public trust with Amazon is pretty high. I mean, we have the one incident where the guy's, you know, basically private conversation with his wife was texted to somebody else. That was a big no, no. But for the most part, you haven't heard anything like this. And they push back against the cops 
who wanted them to like you know give them all the data from when that guy killed another guy and they're like well he had an, he had an echo there so why don't i'm thinking give more the along stuff? the lines of voice control locking down to you know your voice so a stranger can't control your system that sort of thing that uh, just, thing uh, okay. and again it, it's, okay. it's it's all it's it's like medicine we should be preventative we shouldn't be waiting for situations to happen then address them how about we get ahead of the game here and put the security in first before somebody breaks into your house using voice control move fast and break things oh, isn't yeah. that how I'm isn't sorry, that how silicon how valley works, works now that's right yeah. Yeah. no i i really want to try and you know red team some of this stuff one time and just i, I set up i'll set up a bunch in my house and then you can come over and try and break in my house okay <laughs> just from the outside sure without breaking a window you have to use the, you have to use the echo to do <laughs> wait it. i can't pick up an echo and throw it into the window <laughs> oh you could do that old school like, baby yeah, exactly. My dad used to sell security systems. I'm like, so what? How much does a security system cost to make your house, you know, completely secure? He's like, son, there is no such thing as completely secure. You That's can right. just break down a wall if you have to. <laughs> yes. So there is no real security in the world. We sell, we sell hopes and dreams, is what we sell here. <laughs> now, over on Digital Trends, they had a write up on how beneficial is ECG in the new Apple Watch. We asked an expert. Mm -hmm. So. It turns out that, you know, when you normally get an ECG, it, they're, they're going to put 12 wires on you. So they get 12 points of data. Yeah. Now, if they send you home with the device to track you over time, it's going to have one point of data. The Apple Watch has one point of, point data. of data. Right. But it's better than nothing is basically what he's saying. Right. It's like, you know, it, it, it works. It gives you that one point. It's a single lead ECG, but it will give them something useful to track right. over time. So, so home care, preventative care, but not weapons grade. No, no. Unless, you know, <laughs> you start getting the eye nipples and, and all the other <laughs> stickers. The on eye here. ring, the eye nipple, the eye chest pad. Yes, exactly. I'm looking forward to all of these things, but they'll be tastefully designed. Oh, I'm sure they and will. Johnny, dark mode. <laughs> Johnny, I will dark mode your nipples. That's, yes. <laughs> that's what we've got. Oh, show title. <laughs> and uh, chair gate continues. This chair uh, is just toast. What did I it, tell you, Jason? You said go to Craigslist, and What'd friend do, of the show Jason? Trent, friend of the show Trent, also said, "Listen to Brian, go to go to Craigslist." <laughs> I he's like, "I got my Air on ten years ago for three hundred bucks, and it still works great." And so, in about forty five minutes, a gentleman will be showing up from a furniture store in North Hollywood with <laughs> my new Air on chair. I didn't go with the Mira; I went with the Air on because I've always wanted an Air on. So I got a fully loaded Air on size C because I got a big fat ass. For delivered four hundred and five dollars. There you go, like new. So mm -hmm. that, that I looked at it, it was like fourteen hundred new if you just bought it from the Herman Miller store. Yeah, why would you do that? There, there yeah. are so many of these things literally rolling around in in the area because every tech company that went out of business sold them all. Yeah, so I went to Craigslist and I went to my local Craigslist and I typed in Herman Miller and popped up the first ad: one hundred and fifty Herman Miller Aeron chairs, three eighty five <laughs> a piece. Yep. <laughs> so Ed, Chairgate is going out the window here. I'm going to sell this one at a garage sale next week and get some money back to pay for it. And I'm selling all my cameras at the garage sale so uh, to pay for all the rings. And the rings have been fantastic, by the way. I love these things. They're, okay. they're great. Uh, and it's just so much easier to use. I'd so recommend only trying to sell your chair to a thinner person. Because otherwise, as soon as somebody sits down on that, they're just going to go, good junk, good junk, good junk, good junk. Like, yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a hard to replicate thing. You have to hit it. You have to sit on it just right for it to hit that button. Right. And then it like bounces. So I'm, I'm hoping that I can at least get like 50 bucks for it since I paid 200. <laughs> that would be nice. Right. And I had a shower thought the other day. And I, you're going you're, you're gonna to shake your head and go, oh, Jason. But... You know, we always talk about crypto coin and things like that. I'm like, what about mm. crypto? So we can put uh, sex workers on the blockchain. Oh, see, when you put this in the show notes, I thought you just forgot the link because I naturally assumed it was actually real. <laughs> I thought you might. That's kind of why. I... <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, oh, let's let's start crypto. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I did uh, end up watching a little bit of John Oliver this week on YouTube. I haven't yes. watched him in a while, but he had a Facebook bit that was hilarious did you I get know. The... he's stomping on our territory back off john oliver Leave. seriously you do, you do politics we do tech yeah come on <laughs> or at least hire us as writers i mean you're yeah. in town no it was <laughs> a very not? good segment it was very funny and not wrong 
No, Facebook, we are a toilet. Yes. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> and a little bit of follow up on the podcasting news. I said that, you know, because BuzzFeed shut down and then Audible was shutting down. Vox, on the other hand, has doubled down. All right. They've got some new shows coming out, and I figured you'd like this one. Uh, it's called Recode's Pivot with Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway. Since I'm you're a fan a Recode of Kara fan. Swisher, and I'm a fan of Recode, yeah. So I'm, I'd be interested in listening to that. I mean, she's been doing a podcast anyways for quite some time now. It's yeah. just I've been too lazy to actually get around to it. But uh, I just yeah. Well, they put the transcript up, so I just kind of go breeze yeah, through scanned. the transcript. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but the other cool one is um, they're doing one called Vox Media's Function with Anil Dash. And okay. Anil's an old friend, so I'm really looking forward to that. He's a very smart guy. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, one of the guys from the old, old days of blogging back from the... He was working at Movable Type when I met him. Right. And they were on, like, Movable Type 1.4, <laughs> I think, something <laughs> like that. But, yeah, Anil's a really good guy and a very smart guy, so I'm looking forward to that one. And I, it turns out Serial is back. Okay. I didn't even know or care. Nobody does. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> and over on Vulture, there's a there's an article called Serial Still a Juggernaut. The first episode, a bar fight walks into the Justice Center, saw around 1.46 million unique first day downloads, according to PodTrack. And the second one got 1.43 million unique first day downloads. Big it's numbers. But let us remember that I was subscribed to Serial. So I got these as downloads. That doesn't mean I've listened to them. Exactly. That's <laughs> kind of where that comes in. And I know shows that get a lot more than that. Right. So uh, look at Tim Ferriss. He, that, that's like an average show for Tim Ferriss. And right. so it's not really the juggernaut that they're saying it is. But then again, this this article was written by Nicholas Kwa, who writes uh, he writes a podcasting newsletter, which just it, it kind of I hate it. I hate his newsletter <laughs> because all it does is it, it, it just talks to the power curve. Like, you know, it's only people that are at NPR or the big people doesn't go into depth for anything like that. So with with any of the smaller shows or the smaller networks or things like that. So, you know, he's trying to be like, you know, the NBC of podcasting. And I'd rather have the vice of podcasting. So, yeah. And I recommend the pod news email newsletter. That one's really good. That's uh, from this guy uh, down in Australia. It's much, ah. much better. I'll put a link to that one in the show notes. That's the one that I really get my good news from. But uh, but it's interesting that Serial is back. And as far as I can tell, nobody gave a shit. Yeah. You know, I was I, I loved I loved the first season. It was fantastic. Second one totally lost me. Then they did the third one that wasn't really a serial thing, but produced by Serial, but still kind of promoted as if it were serial. And that was oh, S-Town. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So uh, I'm out. Oh, the one that they got. Uh, yeah. S-Town, the one that they, they, the S is for getting sued. <laughs> so, town. yeah. Got to get those releases, guys. In the news. So last week you brought up Cody Wilson, the guy who did the 3D printed guns mm -hmm. and was uh, brought up on sexual assault charges and had uh, absconded off to Taiwan. Yes. Well, it turns out he should go to a country maybe without extradition because <laughs> they hunted him down and sent him back. Oops. So he was immediately arrested and is now out on a $150,000 bond. Okay. So we'll keep an eye on this one because yeah. there was another article I saw in Ars Technica that uh, said basically without him, his company can't survive. I think his so, company is him, really. Yeah, kind of, probably. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what, what What do you actually do? You put up plans on the Internet for people to for make free. a gun. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, great business model there. So. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we've talked a lot about the Internet of Things and how ridiculous the security level is on these things. Uh, some stuff ships without even having an ability to change a password. Some stuff ships without a password. Uh, California is once again leading the way. Uh, California is considering legislation that will institute strict password settings for the network of smart physical devices that collect and share data that they acquire from users and their surroundings. SB 327. Reasonable security feature or features must be included on all devices beginning January 1st, 2020. Uh, this bill also mandates the manufacturers must provide default passwords that are unique to each device, which is unheard of. I think that's an amazing idea. <laughs> uh, or prompt the user to generate a new password before using the product. Perfect. Great. I love this. Yay. Yep. Go California. <laughs> yeah. Amcrest was, uh, they, they have a default password. It is admin. <laughs> but they do make you change the password when you do set up the camera, so that's good. Ring does the same. You have to set up a new account and a new password. Yeah. So good on it's those. It's basically going to force the low-lying fruit to do what the better companies are already doing. <laughs> the low-lying fruit, yes. Uh, which would be most of the really cheap shit that comes out of China. Yeah. 
There is a great article over at Ars Technica called Low Pay, Poor Prospects, and Psychological Toll, The Perils of Microtask Work. Mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to read this one? I did. This is a great article, and it talks about the United Nations International Labor Organization study that just came out that basically said, this is bullshit. <laughs> like yeah, Amazon, Amazon's Mechanical Turk and all these we are other places. screwing people left, right, and center. Yeah, there's, you know, it's way below the, you know, minimum wage level, and people are becoming psychologically traumatized because they have to look at your dick pics all day. <laughs> yeah. The interesting thing about this article was I, I actually... I almost never do this because I tend to think of myself as intelligent, but I clicked on the comments link because oh, I no. wanted to see it. Oh, no, no, no. The interesting thing about this is there are a lot of people commenting in here saying, we use these to train our machine learning algorithms. <laughs> so you are basically putting yourself out of a job because once our algorithms get good enough, we're going to fire you. Well, well. Which is... <laughs> yeah, I mean, what they're expecting is that their machine learning algorithms will eventually work. Yes, which <laughs> we're not so away. sure that they will. <laughs> exactly. So you might just be, you know, this is this is the redistribution of wealth from venture capitalists that I always talk about and I always love. It's like, OK, here's one hundred million dollars for your company. Go out and crack this nut. And then they spread the money around and it gets back into the ecosystem. And then the company goes under. Perfect. Yeah. Redistribution of wealth. From the rich to the poor. I love it. Except for the fact Except that these people are paid it's not so living little. wages. Yes, not it is, even it is, close. Yeah, it's it's unconscionable how, how little they're actually getting paid for their work. Um, and speaking of that, we've been talking about this for a long time. Another company that is basically the business plan is as soon as we get self-driving cars, we're firing all your asses. Yeah. Uh, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers and other gig economy workers are earning half what they did five years ago. Oh, surprise, yeah. surprise. Yeah. So on average, drivers who transport people, Uber, or Lyft, or Things, Eats, or Postmates through an app made 53% less in 2017 than they did in 2013, according to a new study by J.P. Morgan Chase Institute that looks at online gig economy payments into Chase checking accounts. Now, as we've discussed on the show a couple times, it's very, very difficult for anybody to track the gig economy. Uh, a lot of it is under the table <laughs> and yeah. not really being reported and things of that nature. But uh, they are saying it's definitely down, uh, which is not surprising because there's a lot more people out there doing it. Uh, the prices have had to drop in order for people to continue to use these sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> according to JP Morgan, drivers on average are potentially working fewer hours. Demand hasn't increased to meet the increased number of drivers, meaning we've re we've reached a critical mass of stupid, you know, cheap transportation out there. Right. Uh, prices have fallen. Platforms are paying drivers lower rates uh, because you have to make the money that they used to make because, you know, they're a company. So. All in all, uh, this is going exactly the direction that I kind of thought it would. Not looking good for people doing this as a job. Yeah, because everybody's like, oh, I can drive for Lyft and make lots of money. But everybody did that. And so yep. now <laughs> there's too many drivers and too few rides. The and thing the, that depressing, the depressing takeaway from this is J.P. Morgan is basically saying that people are only using this now to supplement regular nine to five jobs because they have to because yep. their regular traditional employment is no longer enough to make ends meet. Yeah, that's yeah. what it comes down to. Now, the thing here that uh, is kind of buried in the lead, um, J.P. Morgan Chase Institute that looks at online gig economy payments into Chase checking accounts. Mm -hmm. Now, did these people give them permission to look at their checking account data? Or probably not. Probably not. I'm sure and it's I'm in the sure fine print somewhere. Anonymized. Air quotes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so... You know, okay, they're making public studies based on what should be private information, but that that creeped me out a bit that these guys are going through and using your checking account data to actually put out studies on, you know, that you didn't authorize them to do. Yeah. So that would I that I thought was a little creepy. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Sirius is going to buy Pandora. Okay. Which I thought mm -hmm. was kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, well, here, I, here's the crazier part. They're buying it for three point five billion dollars. Pandora <laughs> lost about two hundred million dollars in the first half of the year, which right. comes back to how the fuck do these people value these companies? I don't understand it at all. Pandora doesn't make sense to me as a business model. Uh, I, uh, Sirius XM. I, I actually just canceled Sirius XM. Finally. Finally. I was like, okay. I don't know why I'm paying 300 some odd dollars a year for this. Um, I have issues with what they're doing in terms of the, the 
musicians rights stuff that's going through they're def- they're paying lobbyists left right and center to try to block that crap because it costs them money uh but the the main reason is just every time i get in the car i hear the same damn five songs i don't need to pay 300 bucks a year for that i've got a phone <laughs> exactly or just to put uh, it on a put it on a like two gig memory stick and you yeah. can listen to the same five songs and you want to talk about a business models that don't make sense of course they don't let you cancel online you have to call and as soon as you call they oh. offer to drop the price in half yeah it's it's amazing <laughs> i i called to re-up on my because i've got a ford escape with the sirius xm radio in it and they wanted like it was like 98 dollars a year i'm like right. What kind of deal can you give me? Because I'm not going to pay you $98 a year for something that I'm going to listen to as I go back and forth to the CVS, you know? Yeah. And they're like, we, we're not going to give you a deal. I'm like, okay, then cancel. And they're like, okay. So I had a different, different take on it. But I was, I mean, because it was a deal that came with the car. Because I got the first yeah. six months for free <clears throat> right. and was kind of enjoying it. I was listening to Howard Stern and I, I liked that. And right. uh, Tony Hawk was on there. It was cool. But now I'm just like, I'm not going to spend that much money for this that I'm, I'm almost never going to listen to. So right. I don't know how they're still in business. I, I don't understand how either of them are still really in business. The The idea behind this merger, this acquisition is that uh, Sirius XM is primarily used as a premium in-car service, while Pandora is used mostly for streaming music to homes and on mobile devices. Uh I don't know. I can listen to Sirius XM when I had my subscription off my Echo or other devices. There's apps. Uh, all they really have to do is, is you know, split the feed, plug one into the satellite and one into the uh, Wi-Fi over there, and you've got Sirius XM online. I don't quite get it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's mostly Pandora has a huge listening base that are happy to listen to it when it's free. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think Sirius XM has thought through the fact that you're not going to be able to convert a lot at probably any of these people into paying customers, but we'll see. I was a paid Pandora customer for a year and right. it turned out that I didn't, I didn't mind the ads. So now I'm back on the free plan because that's what's hooked up to my Sonus in the house. So I'm, I've got like a radio station that I set up. That's always on in the house. And right. I hear the same, like 50 songs, you know, all the time, yeah. just on a loop, just it's nice background noise, but I'm never going to pay for it. Yeah. And I can hook up so many other things. Like I hooked up radio.com's new app, to the Sono. So I wake up in the morning, I can listen to K Rock in the house. And so I'm not, why would I pay for Sirius? Yeah. You know? I don't know. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not that big of a Howard Stern fan. I really yeah. don't care that much. I mean, I guess that's the only thing that has to be keeping them on the air. And the yeah. In- and he's talking about going away in a couple of years. So we'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah. And there's an interesting article over on Slate called How Sirius XM's Purchase of Pandora Could Change the Balance of Power in the Music Industry. And it talks about how all of these companies are doing curated feeds now to people. Mm -hmm. And it's all a black box, which just, you know, is ripe for payola. It's it's, I mean, it's that's what it is. And the other thing is, like, when Sirius merged with XM like years ago, uh, the federal regulators said, you know, you have to have this much content of this type for at least three years. And then as soon as that went away, they killed eight out of its 10 Latin music stations right off the bat. They're like, okay, we don't have to do it anymore. So we're not going to do it. It just shows the consolidation is a bad thing. Yep. So, shocking. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah. Put a company in charge. Of it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and as we, as we have heard on the internet, Oh no, big news at Instagram. <laughs> If you really care about this, CEO Kevin Systrom and CTO Mike Krieger are leaving the company. Okay. Now, this is really funny because I I found it on TechCrunch this morning, but uh, uh, the Stratechery email newsletter that uh, comes out every day that I that I pay for because I like to pay for the content that that is good. um, It was a great article this morning about how, no, Kevin hasn't been the CEO of Instagram since they sold it. That's been yep. Mark Zuckerberg because yep. <laughs> he's your boss. <laughs> yes. So it's kind of interesting that uh, everybody keeps saying, oh, the CEO of Instagram is leaving. No, no, actually not. The CEO of Instagram is still right there and his name is Mark Zuckerberg. But, exactly. you know, Kevin was very upset and so was this other guy who I've never heard of, uh, Mike Krieger. The, the Facebook has basically said, okay, you know, uh, honeymoon's over. We're going inst- in, to we're gonna do more integration with Facebook now. That's For supposedly that's smart people, these people are very fucking stupid. I what think, did they think was going to happen? Naive, naive did they t- think <laughs> they were going to get 
autonomy? Did they think Instagram was going to continue to just be this thing that Facebook paid gazillions of dollars for and we're just going to leave it alone? Are you fucking stupid? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's right. kind of it. I, I, you know, I put it up to uh, Silicon Valley naivete. Take your bags of money and go live in Hawaii. That's what. Go buy Hawaii as much money yeah. as they got, because, <laughs> yeah, it's like they got a billion dollars, but a part of that was seven hundred million dollars in Facebook stock back then, years yep. ago, which is worth over four billion dollars now. You're a billionaire yep. with a b b b b bugger off. I don't know why you're <laughs> complaining. This is a, th- th- that's the dream. That's what everybody here is trying to do. Yeah, it's exactly what just happened to you. So shut up and go take the bags of money. Go build your mountain lair in New Zealand and never (laughs) speak to us again. Yes. Unfortunately, of course, they won't. And we're going to get some dumb app from them. That's not going to do anything. So, yeah, no, I mean, once you we in the old days, we always wanted fuck you money. And now (laughs) I just want these people to have fuck off money. So go fuck off and leave me alone. (laughs) That's what it is. You have the fuck off money. Go away. (laughs) Oh, man. And this one, next one came over back, uh, back to uh, some more Facebook stuff over on Quartz.com. When Facebook goes down, people go read the news. Okay. <laughs> go figure. <laughs> go uh, figure. F- yeah, Facebook experienced a 45-minute outage on August 3rd. And there was a study that uh, basically showed that, oh, all the news websites got more traffic. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Yep. Yeah, when you when you don't want to feed from the teat of the zuck, then you actually have to go out and get news. Everything is pointing to the fact that Facebook is just terrible for the world. <laughs> Honestly. And yeah, I haven't yeah. missed it. I have not missed it. I've been off for a couple of weeks now and I have not missed it. I'm off Good. Twitter now for the next like 5 or 6 weeks because I'm I've got to go heads down on a new thing that I'm writing and it'll be out we'll announce that when it comes out, but it's like I just don't have the time to have these things like taking that little bit of attention away because we know what cost switching is. You know, if you go look at Twitter, then before you can get back into your your main flow, it's, you know, like half an hour to 45 minutes just to get back in the headspace. So I took it off my phone. I blocked it from my computer. It's it's gone for a while and it's been it's been deliciously silent. <laughs> I love it. OK. Also over at Quartz. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait to talk about this one. One small change to New York's intersections is saving pedestrians' lives. Now, this is okay. a this is an article that just talks about how they made some some easy changes to an intersection to put in some speed bumps in the right place. And I love I love what this article is about. And I think Brian, you kind of hit on the same point that I was going to have about this this article on courts would you like to take over (laughs) i wasn't sure if you wanted to actually talk about the content of the article which i didn't find particularly interesting or the wankery douchebaggery design uh of (laughs) this is the most horrible bullshit i've seen in a long time i think somebody who just figured out css and and uh, javascript went to town and somehow this got approved Get to the goddamn point. I am scrolling, 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 scrolling. Oh, aren't we clever? Exactly. Yes, it is. It is a masturbatory design for the web for the for sure. And what it comes down to is I I like the city design aspect of this article because anything that can, you know, make it easier to be a pedestrian and walking around, which I thought you might get a kick out of, too, because you're almost killed every day by a fucking Prius. Yep. Um, to slow people down when they're making dangerous turns. I think it's a great article about that, but it could have been basically four paragraphs and a couple of JPEGs. You know? Oh, totally. Yeah, instead it of all not. this wankery. But I mean, the thing that upsets me about the content of the article itself is, God, we have just had to dumb down everything because people don't pay attention and they're just stupid. You- 20 years ago, we didn't need to stick gigantic barriers to stop people from running people over. Oh, because we didn't have people on cell phones 20 yeah. years ago. People, people weren't sitting there on Facebook trying to <laughs> trying to gram their tweet as they're making a left turn in their fucking Prius, you know, that you that nobody can hear. Yeah. You know, we also yeah, we also had V8s back then. So we could hear <laughs> hear them coming when we used to like burn gasoline and hit the gas. But yeah. yeah, no, it's 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 one of those changes that is unwelcome, but needs addressing. And I think I think this speed bump trick addresses the problem. And I thought I, I liked it. That's all. That's all that was about. And over at the New York Times, this was this was an interesting one. I found uh, a friend of mine sent me 
For hackers, anonymity was once critical, and that's changing. This is an mm -hmm. article by Stephen Hiltner, and it talks about the, the landscape of the security researchers and how everybody always used to have a handle. Everybody was anonymous. But now these people are getting hired by Fortune you know, 100 companies, and yeah. you, cannot, you cannot have a check made out to your idiot handle that you had on <laughs> CompuServe 20 years ago. You know, yes. so but I thought it was I thought it was a nice middle ground for, you know, talking about how some of these people are coming out of the shadows and actually talking about who they are. And there was one quote in there. Hiding behind a fake name doesn't mean you're doing something malicious and it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you're trying to protect your privacy, which which is, you know, a valid concern. But when you are making a living as a security researcher, I think, you know, you have yeah. to have a public persona. You can't go to an interview and say, uh, oh, yeah, I was I was dank memes. Ninety two. That was me. <laughs> dank. <memes. laughs> OK, you, you know, yeah. it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, but it's you know, it's a, it's just an interesting thought experiment to talk about how these guys like if I'm going to come up with a solution to a hack that I found or out somebody that is, you know, very dangerous character over in Russia um, and I don't like polonium soup, maybe. I do want to release it under a pseudonym, you know, just for personal yeah. protection, because some of these people are putting things out. I mean, just look at all the shit Brian Krebs gets for mm -hmm. his his articles, you know. So I, I see I see both sides of this. And it's it's interesting. It's it's an interesting tightrope to walk for some of these people. Yeah. And back to the N NYT, the old New York mm -hmm. Times. I actually had to call them this week because online you can't actually cancel your subscription to the physical paper. You have to talk to a human. Right. And I've been I've been using the uh, their service to get the digital version, which you enjoy from my mm -hmm. account. <laughs> um, yes, I do. But I also get the physical paper and right. it's time to kill the physical paper. I don't need yeah. it. It it basically goes in recycling. So it's just a waste of waste of trees. So so the New York Times has sued the FCC. OK. And they're suing because they want the data from, remember a while ago when they, we had the net neutrality open comments? Oh, yes. Time? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, yes. And all the dead people were s yes. sending in comments about it. We yes. don't want it. We don't want Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the New York Times wants to find out if there was Russian interference in that process because mm -hmm. the, the repeal of net neutrality is bullshit and they're fighting for it. And the FCC keeps coming back and saying, no, you cannot have our server logs because it's going to then basically give out personal information for people that, that signed up for the comments. Now, there's two problems here. One, that's public data because it's run by a basically public government agency. Company. It, yes. Well, no, not a public company, a <laughs> government a public agency. Company, but a government company. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sunshine laws. Yep. And the fact that they, they actually came back to the FCC several times and said, no, we're going to pare it down so we can't do it. We just want to know. Just give us the IP addresses and the headers. Can you just give us the IP addresses and the headers? And that way we can match, match them up, see if there were some bots in action and where those IP addresses came from. And they still said no. And so the New York Times said, well, F you, we're going to sue you. And Good. hopefully they'll hopefully they'll win. Yeah. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, and I, Southern California is great for many reasons. And one of my favorites is that there are no mosquitoes here. Very few. I, yeah, not many, not, in, not in my neck of the woods. It's too damn hot. They just burst into little <laughs> balls of flame, but I come from, you know, the Midwest and the East coast where mosquitoes are a problem. I don't come from sub-Saharan Africa where they're a real problem and there's malaria everywhere or Asia where there's malaria. But I found this yep. story in Wired and it says, here's the plan to end malaria with CRISPR edited mosquitoes. And as oh, soon boy. as I read that, my, my spidey <laughs> sense perked up. I'm like, Oh, do tell. Do tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, if okay. this if this works, this is going to be one of the greatest breakthroughs in science history. But what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I, for one, would like to first extend the greeting to our eight foot malaria <laughs> mosquito overlords. Exactly. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I've seen Starship Troopers. I know what those bugs are going to look like, and I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, so I, li I do like in the story. More tests have to be done first. No shit. No shit. <laughs> How about a lot? How about let's, you know, figure out what happens uh, with the whole ecosystem, too. If we we just oh, this is terrifying stuff. Th that's what I mean. That's what I mean. It's like, OK, let's just release all these mosquitoes into the wild. No, at least they're doing all the tests in the laboratory right now for now. OK, but, you know, <laughs> you know, it's coming and they have a they have a custom built facility outside of Rome 
I don't know why Rome is the hotbed of mosquito testing, but <laughs> yeah, this is this is terrifying. Yeah, there, here's one line. In order to spread their genetic time bomb through a wild population, they have to be competitive with wild males. Okay, um, right there, genetic time bomb. Th- th- right? Yes. That, that's scary. I, I mean, I know you're scientists. You know, I know you mean <laughs> well. But... <laughs> But, yes. and this is funded in part, in, in the most part, by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, Bill Gates could actually be bringing about the end of the world. Great. This episode is sponsored by Privacy. Privacy is the first payments product that keeps your personal information, well, private, while being even more convenient than using a regular credit card online. Privacy lets you generate a brand new Visa card number for every purchase you make online with one click with their browser extension or mobile app. We all buy stuff online more and more, and Privacy gives you a temp credit card number for every site you buy from. Never forget to cancel subscriptions or trials ever again. That alone is worth the price of admission, and yes, the price of admission is free, and you get $5 in credit. Don't forget that. They make their money the same way debit cards do with interchange fees. And one thing that I've been doing now is I have a privacy card just for Amazon that is tied to my bank account, and I can put in funds and say, hey, no, just don't spend that much on that crap that you always buy from Amazon. It is my own personal safety valve. I love this stuff. Sign up takes less than two minutes, and like I said, it's completely free. And so far, they saved their customers over $100 million in unwanted and unauthorized charges. Look, it's controlled. You can freeze cards and set spending limits, which is what I do, which is fantastic because sometimes I have a little too much vino, and then out comes the Amazon delivery fleet. And it's secure. Cards lock to merchants, making them useless to thieves and hackers. And it's private. You can protect yourself from online fraud with virtual card numbers. Finally, it's disposable. You can delete cards anytime and kiss those forgotten subscriptions goodbye. So to sign up for free and get a $5 credit, just go to privacy.com slash GOG. That's $5 free to spend anywhere by just signing up. Privacy.com slash GOG. Get on it now. Seriously, this thing is just, it's so useful. And I'm so happy to have them as a sponsor. Privacy.com slash GOG. Media Candy. Patrick Stewart shares first photo from new Star Trek Picard show. Woo! Make it so. so. Make it so. Sort of. It's just a bunch of them sitting around and announcing the writers on the show and all that sort of stuff. So there's no spoilers. There's no nothing. But it's something. It is something. It's, it's, a, it's, it a, is. A, it's a something nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's something to, that, that, that is actually happening. That's what. Yes, I'm very excited about that. So Another thing that it seems is actually happening is Tenacious D is going to make a sequel to The Pick of Destiny. I was one of three people that liked that movie. <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> woo, I guess. Uh, Look, I'm a fan of the D. I love the album, the first album. Um, you know, and, and you know, 18-year-old me would probably love the fact that there's another movie. Uh, didn't care for the movie when it came out. Nobody did. I'm the only one that liked it because I never watched Tenacious D's. Like, they never watched their show. I never listened to their albums. And this was like my right. first foray into the D. And... Okay. I was just I was smitten with it. And and also in, in the old guitar hero, there was a song, The Metal, that was cut from the right. movie but was still on the soundtrack. And I played that incessantly on Expert trying to beat it. And I I beat it like twice. <laughs> it was really hard. Okay. <laughs> Kyle can fucking play guitar. It's really yes, tough. He can. Um <laughs> on the opposite side of that, I found a new app called Sleeping Dragon, Calming Tones mm-hmm. Sound Generator. Okay. Uh, this would normally be in apps and gadgets, but I wanted to throw it in here now because it's one of those things where if you have trouble sleeping and you need some kind of like ambient music to go to bed to, mm-hmm. this is a great one. And okay. I really dig it. And there's an app for the iPhone. They, they said that there was an app for Mac OS, but I think they pulled it. It doesn't exist anymore. You can't find it. But right. um, it's pretty cool. I dig it. Okay. Or you can listen to Dead Can Dance. I love they them too. They have a new too. song called The Mountain, <laughs> and they have an upcoming album called Dionysus, which will be out on November 2nd, and then they will be touring. So all very exciting stuff coming from them. They are one of my favorite bands out there. Oh, so mine too. Excited. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen them live. I would love to go. So oh, one of the best things you can ever do in your life. If it's amazing. Yeah. Well, I, t- I, I take your concert recommendations very seriously because 
you for years said, you got to go see The Cure. You got to go see The Cure. And I finally went and I saw The Cure. And it was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. So, yeah, um, maybe we can go together. Perhaps. Perhaps. We shall see what the uh, dates are. And I put this one in the show because you're a Dan Rather fan. And I, am. I found out he has a podcast. Ah. He doesn't do it very often. He does one a month. <laughs> But you know, I, I like Dan rather a lot. Uh, he's definitely putting himself out there as this uh, really wizened journalistic voice. I get kind of everything I need from him from what he posts on Facebook. Now, friend of the show, Mike is a huge fan of the interview series he does. Like for this guy is ramping up, not slowing down. Yeah. He's doing a podcast. He's doing a TV, you know, interview series. He's posting on social media left, right, and center. He started up a whole new like a uh, news network. Go Dan. Yeah, seriously, man. I wish I had that much energy now. That he has, yeah, and he's old. Yes. <laughs> oh, older. We're, we're still pretty old. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and, you know, I don't know what it is with people named Dan that can't put out more episodes, because Dan Carlin, you know, he, he comes on the scene, drops a bomb, and then runs away, and then you don't hear from him for five months, and then he puts out another one. And, oh, that's another show that, like, you know, probably five million downloads the first day that just puts right. cereal to shame. But uh, the other night, he dropped one of his hardcore history addendums, uh, right. Nightmares of the Indianapolis. Did you get a chance to listen to this one yet? Uh, no, I did not even know it was out yet. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Because the, the story of the Indianapolis sinking is one of the right. most terrifying stories of, of World War II. And it was like, you know, because they were carrying parts for, I think, uh, you know, the nuclear program. So nobody knew that they were out there. Nobody came to look for them. They got found on accident. but after the ship sank because they got hit by a couple torpedoes and the ship sank and there were a bunch of bunch of people in the water unfortunately it was shark infested water yes i know the story yeah, yeah yeah it is terrifying and dan recounts it in in the only way that dan carlin can to make it even scarier Rapidly. than it normally would be <laughs> yes oh man great episode i i'm so glad he put this one out i'm actually going to go back and listen to it again just because you know <laughs> it's a, I'm not going to hear anything from him for another six months, so I might as well get my Dan in. Now that he doesn't do his other show, his, his political show. You can't show. do common sense because, as he says, there is no common sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but speaking of common sense, Sam Harris has a, a ton of it. And he has a new episode called The Edge of Humanity, a conversation with Yuval Noah Harari, the guy that wrote Sapiens. Mm -hmm. And I loved this episode so much. And it rem just reminds me of why we need to just take more time for ourselves to think, you know, right. you've all he meditates two hours a day so he can get focused, which is insane because I'm like, yes. that's that's a long time. I can't meditate for more than 10 minutes, <laughs> but when I do, it really helps. But he also talks about universal basic income and how it needs to be thought out more because it's not universal. It's not basic. And it's, you know, it, it's it's a problem. <laughs> Yes, so people who throw the term around like we do may want to think about it a little bit more, but he's got a new book coming out, which we'll talk about in a second. But yeah, it's a great, great uh, interview. I highly recommend everybody go check it out. Right. Uh, as you know, I've been working my way through Dark Matter, the show that lasted three seasons and then uh, did not get picked up after that. Uh, <sighs> I should have Googled it. I should have asked you. <laughs> um, well, you didn't, I, if you asked me, I'd be like, I've never heard of Dark Matter. So. My rule of, of these shows is I always want them to last at least three seasons uh, before I watch something because I don't want to get totally invested in something that's just going to get dumped. I have an addendum to that rule now. <laughs> uh, I have to watch three seasons and know that there was a final episode or wrap up of some sort. Um, I was uh, the other night I was watching uh, season three and uh, I kind of, you know how Netflix will just kind of roll into the next episode. And I'd had a little bit of wine and my wife and kid were asleep. So it was daddy downtime. Yep. Yep. I was enjoying and I really enjoy the show. Uh, so it rolled into the next episode and I watched that and I was like, all right, it's time to go to bed. Um, man, that's a hell of a cliffhanger. I can't wait to watch the next episode. And that was it. <laughs> and I came up the next night and uh, discovered that that was the final episode that was ever aired. And uh <laughs> so disappointing oh, it was such a good show and it was heading towards in such a good direction and it ended on such an amazing cliffhanger and there's nothing well make sure it should be a, make sure you thumbs should up be a it. rule make sure you thumbs yeah, up it I, maybe netflix will pick it up because they've got they're all money. on other shows already it's oh, been too long it's done it's been there should be a rule that these show writers have to like at least put out a synopsis of what would have happened they would have done with the characters but of course that would require that they knew 
what was going to happen with the characters. And as we know from all these shows, these people fucking make it up until the very end. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, you got deadwooded on that one. You oh, totally man, got dead. Sucked. I'm sorry. Sucked. I was so depressed when I came out the next night and I was like loading it up and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? That was the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really glad that I, I held off to watch that one because now I don't it, have It's to. very good. It's very good. But uh, you have to know that uh, there will be no resolution <laughs> if you want to go in and watch it. Uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. And speaking of uh, resolutions, uh, the first episode of the final season of Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown aired this weekend. It was very good. And uh, there seems to be some backtracking. We thought there was going to be three to four fully complete episodes. But the interviews I saw after this aired said that this is the last one that has like the full narration. Oh. Oh, really? Bourdain. Oh, so we'll see what happens. OK, it's on the DVR. I'll check it out when I'm in the mood to get sad. It's, good. it's very good. <laughs> and uh, they, they did some good editing at the end. And after you, it might get a little misty. That's what I'm saying. When, I, when I'm in the mood to yeah. be sad, then I'll watch it. Yeah. But I, I watched Skyscraper with You're an The Rock. <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Um, the last movie I saw from him was Rampage, which was. I am. If I ever see him, I'm going to have to punch him in the nuts for Rampage because it was so bad. And Skyscraper is his attempt at doing Die Hard. I, I think right. it's kind of like Die Hard. And mm -hmm. it was tolerable. We'll just say it's tolerable. Right. Not great, but tolerable. Okay. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, <laughs> that's all that's I as far it. as I can go. <laughs> that's, that's as far as I can go with it. So if you're stuck on a plane and drunk, watch it, but, uh, otherwise probably skip it. And then I watched the first purge. Okay. I haven't seen any of the purge stuff since the first movie came out. I watched the first movie. I love the concept. So, are you telling me that the first purge isn't the first purge? No, it's not. The purge was already happening by the first movie. So they, <laughs> this is a prequel to, to everything. Okay. And All right. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> I really okay. enjoyed it because the way it works with the purge is the first movie had a budget of like three million dollars. And then the next one maybe had four. <laughs> They're cheaply made movies. They're just, you know, no cheap way. Horror movies. <laughs> so they put more money into this one. But it was a good story. Good actors. Good action. All all along the way. I mean, I really enjoyed the first purge. And the only reason that I went back and watched this was because. There's a Purge TV series out now, believe it or not. Okay. So I downloaded right. the first three episodes of that before because I, I missed it on my, my DVR because I kept seeing the commercials for it. And I thought there were commercials for the first Purge, the movie, because I knew that was coming out. But no, they're for a TV series. So I'm okay. going to check that out. But if you're into that I know thing, uh, I know nothing about the Purge. So I'm just looking at their IMDb. DB page for the movie that uh, the first purge America's third political party, the new founding fathers of America comes to power and conducts an experiment. No laws for 12 hours on Staten Island. No one has to stay on the island, but $5,000 is given to anyone who does. And well, now I'm intrigued. I didn't know it was an experiment in universal basic income. <laughs> yeah, there you go. This is what happens when you get UBI. <laughs> um, no, because the first one was the entire country. The first movie was like in the United States to, you know, let let some steam off. Everybody has 24 hours, one one day a year or 12 hours, whatever it is, uh, to basically kill and murder or do whatever you want. It's that's pretty right. much what it is. And we used to think about this long, long ago before the movies ever came out. And we called it uh, let, let's have a Darwin Day. Right. <laughs> let's just have Darwin Day <laughs> in survival of the fittest happens because there are some people you just want to take out. And this right. this kind of goes along with that theme. And I, I mean, I like the movie. I like the first Purge movie. So yeah. the, the other movies I can't talk about except for the first movie that came out. And that was mediocre at best. Right. OK, well, I'm not a big stage or play person, but uh, I might be dragging my ass to a theater at some point in the near future. All About Eve is being adapted for the stage. It's a 1950s classic and Best Picture Oscar winner. But PJ Harvey is going to do the score and it stars Gillian Anderson. PJ Harvey and Gillian Anderson involved in the same project, Be Still My 1990s Heart. Oh my god, I gotta dust off the passport. Let's head over to London. Yes. Let's set up some grumpy old geeks action over there. Who wants to, who wants to fly us over yes. to do a live show Have and get us some theater tickets? <laughs> Moron of the week. 
Some might think that the first real sign of autumn's arrival is colder weather, falling leaves, or maybe even seasonal lattes. But the wisest among us know that the true harbinger of fall is the annual viral Halloween costume. (laughs) Uh, This is over on Slate. It's hard to truly top 2017's Anne Frank's children's costume or the tranny granny sold by Walmart in 2016. But 2018 might have done it. The sexy handmade costume. (laughs) God. <laughs> First spotted on Twitter, Yandy's brave red maiden costume is a sexy take on the iconic red robes that enslaved surrogates are forced to wear in Hula's dystopian drama, The Handmaid's Tale. Yandy's ex, but make it a slutty version of a symbol of women's state-sanctioned depression, included a hooded red cloak, a red mini dress, and a white bonnet hat that, according to the website copy, allows the wearer to be bold and speak your mind. Yeah, somebody so. never watched the show. <laughs> <laughs> Outrage was swift and mocking, <laughs> and within 24 hours of the costume making the rounds on Twitter, Yandy pulled it from their site with a statement that includes the mesmerizing lines. Over the last few hours, it has become obvious that our Yandy's brave red maiden costume is being seen as a symbol of women's oppression rather than an expression of women's empowerment. Go figure. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, my God. How, how could anybody, anybody think that that was a good idea? Look, this is a world now where we just throw this shit out there and see what sticks. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> oh, God. Break, move fast and break things, Jason. That's right. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, uh, Linus Torvalds is in the news. He has mm-hmm. apologized for years of being a jerk and takes time off to learn empathy. <laughs> Excuse me? Okay. Uh, 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 awesome. uh, God, I mean, this guy is just, he's a famous dick. I mean, he's yeah. terrible to the people that help him make his product that has probably made him millions and millions of dollars. You know, the open source software package Linux, which everybody uses. I use it. You use it. Everybody uses it. Everybody's got some Linux yeah. in them. And now he's just like, well, maybe they were right. And I should just go like, I, I, I think I need a timeout. <laughs> so, well, you know, good for him uh, for recognizing it. A little, a little now, late after he's made a lot of money. Yeah, ex- that's it. He's like, um, actually, I got to go just spend my money. Uh, yeah. So I'll see you guys in a little bit, but I'll be nicer when I come back. Right. Oh, my God. What a dumb shit. And I found this one just randomly. I can't even remember where I found it. But thieves caught hours after stealing GPS tracking devices from a tech company. <laughs> Did we make sure they're off? Apparently not. No, apparently no. not. <laughs> now, these are devices that usually go into cargo containers to track shipments. But, you know, they thought that they looked cool, so they would steal them. And then the company's like, well, let's turn them on. <laughs> go find them. <laughs> it took them like four hours to find them. And they had about $18,000 worth of the devices. And the CEO is saying, well, our shit works. We found them. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so and the unfortunate part for these thieves is they put these trackers well they had some in their cars and they were just driving around but they put the bulk of them in their warehouse with all of their other stolen shit so the cops like found them and uh, found all the other stolen stuff and apparently one of the things that was in there was like some really rare world war ii photographs that this collector had and uh, they were stolen by these guys. And so they they returned the photos. So he was very happy about that. But talk about dumb shittery. Let's steal yep. GPS tracking devices. How are they ever going to find us? <laughs> Feedback loop. We got some new Patreon subscribers. Lust Dante, Adam, Gadil, Andy, Bob, and Benjamin. Thank yes. you so much, guys. Thank you. And Peter wrote us. So, Jason, on the topic of Chairgate 2018, unfortunately, it would seem that I am walking in your footprints, maybe two weeks behind with my own painfully cheap knockoff of what I can only imagine is what it looks like when a Formula One bucket seat fucks a Republic of Gamers fire sale <laughs> on Amazon. That's what they look like. Uh, the yep. squeaking <laughs> sounds like I hadn't seen my girlfriend since I left for Nam, and after the piston started hinting at potentially crapping out on me, I see a similar future awaiting. I tried to know what I was getting into first as best I could as far as the warranty is concerned and since I can just about guarantee that your chair my chair and every other gaming chair duplicate of the same company it seems the manufacturer warranty with these things are pretty standard and they're bullshittery and it gets into specific details here so very funny note sorry that you had a very crappy time with the chair I give you the same advice I gave Jason go check Craigslist yeah what I love is he did the math on what it would take to return this thing and yeah. it's like about 
$3,465 to send it back to, to Shenzhen if you have the original box, which nobody does. <laughs> it was a giant box. So thanks, Peter, for the note. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, it's... if you all just would have listened to me. Anthony writes in, hey, I never used my pimp something out reward and I have something now, but it's not needed at all. And I don't mind either way as you're both awesome and the highlight for two of my days a week now. Anyways, down to the dirt. I run a web hosting company. Yeah, one of those things. Oh, my God. Still. And for years, we've offered free services for teachers teaching students code, but we just expanded it today to actually include any student. And the student can register from a huge list of over 9,000 schools and growing. So with this, all students with a school email can get access to a free level of our sites, as many sites as they want, if not for company use, as well as our other services and stuff being 50% off for the life of the account. (sighs) All right. Here's the link for more info. Go to nodehost.ca slash teachers. Yes. Nodehost.ca slash teachers. Woohoo. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Over on Twitter, Nathan wrote in, no human stacks books this way. Ghostbusters. Unfortunately, he was beat by super listener Chad, who got in faster. So super listener Chad, DM us your address and we'll send you some stickers. Uh, he also said, great new episode, but have to say that Bittner stole the show with his Casey Kasem bits. And now for our long distance dedication. And that's what we've got this week. So remember, till next time, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. I I totally agree. Bittner stole the show. Yes. <laughs> Nerd Review writes in, if you guys like delicious burgers, you have to go to Plan Check. They make my favorite burger in L.A., the Blueprint Burger. Have you been to Plan Check? I have not, but I will have to go check it out. Yeah. Anthony wrote us, I just raised my pledge to $23 on Patreon, so you are now at $1,000 exactly. We've actually gone over that now since then. Now it's time for our Live Friday shows. You know, we wrote those things before we realized where we'd be at, so we'll figure out something. But uh, live shows are kind of boring for most people, so we'll figure it out. You get, basically, you hear the same show, but I fuck up a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we'll figure out something. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to redo those Patreon pledges soon. And figure out something that people might actually like, but it'll probably end up being like one night Brian and I get drunk and let everybody come and hang out with us. Probably on, yeah. on Twitch. In you fact, know, we were supposed to rewrite those things while we were at Fireside, but we got drunk. We out. got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot to do it. <laughs> Therein lies the rub. Yeah. Mr. Beardy Cuff writes in with a YouTube link. Product management director avoiding the question given. How does Instagram make money off all these businesses? Made me think of recent talks about Snapchat and how they make any money ever. Hashtag GOG. Yeah, well, you so, can watch it. It's, a, it's artistry and bullshittery in motion. It's quite nice. Uh, it happened in May, wrote us. Uh, love listening to your show. Found this and thought of you guys. Former Facebook employee Selena Scola seeks a class action suit on behalf of moderators, saying the company has failed to adequately, adequately prepare them for the job. Well done. Good. Sue. Oh, Sweet. Yeah, Sue, so she says uh, says the job gave her PTSD and Sue is suing the company. Uh, it's a class action for the 7,500 or so other people collectively screened around 10 million posts a week. Uh, and they're all based. I can't even believe this. They're based in San Mateo, you know, San Francisco, Menlo Park. Whoa. How can they possibly afford rent around there just doing moderation? Yeah, I don't That's know. That's amazing. So. It is. And that goes back to one of the things from the uh, the article at the beginning on Microwork saying that these people are getting three dollars an hour in ptsd yeah so here's your here's your here's your check for 34 dollars and have some ptsd on the side <laughs> yes all uh, right tris writes in regarding scooters on military bases in strava and people as i note wherever i'm working on user guides people are stupid yes they are <laughs> said this today in fact when taking out a section on wiping devices at the end of a guide on setting a device up i figured someone would do it <laughs> And Rocky sent in something that I'm sure is for you. How the three seashells work. Reddit edition. Oh, no, d- dude. I don't even I don't have to read this because the director came out and said, no, there's not going to be anything about that. No. Uh, no. So somebody made up a, a yes. joke on the three seashells. But no, no. The director said that was a MacGuffin. You you do not get to ever know what the three seashells do. So anybody that's making this up is not involved with the movie, damn it. It's not official. It's not sanctioned. It's not canon. <laughs> it's not canon. Yeah, I was going to say, these, these, these uh, three seashells are not canon. And Giovanni writes in, for selling electronics, lately I've been using Swappa. <laughs> Swappa. What a fucking dumb name. All the names are gone, it's, man. <laughs> I know. It's really simple, and all the posts seem to be verified by actual human people. An amazing concept. Uh, well... Seem to be. Well, what we've learned is uh, all machine learning is people. 
<laughs> so it's people all the way down. Yeah. Everything I've posted has always sold within a day or two. So at least right. he's actually selling something yeah. on it. So Good. I, I'll give it a shot. Right That's films interesting because I've got tons. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so a lot of people do. Uh, right film sleep repeat wrote in, I didn't break, but the car should have done it for me for fuck's sake. I do like the ar- title of this article over at the register, Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Mitsubishi recalls 68,000 SUVs over buggy software. So there's something in the software that uh, is not doing the automatic braking. <clears throat> I don't even think I've ever had a car that has automatic braking. I, I just pay attention. Well, no, you know what it usually is? It's when you're in um, uh, what is the uh, cruise control. Right. So if somebody stops, it'll it'll automatically slow you down. And that's a feature of a lot of cars nowadays. Okay. I don't have fancy cars like that, mm. but... Uh, yeah, someday, someday I'll, I will have the technology. Right. So Kyle writes in follow up from the ramen shop signs and autonomous cars. All of the things that still baffle self-driving cars, starting with seagulls. <laughs> this is an article over at Quartz.com. Yes. Uh, as we've been saying, and they agree with us, uh, we're still a long way from self-driving, despite marketing to the contrary. Um, and then it goes into a list. Uh, altered stop signs, which is Jason's favorite. You've always talked mm-hmm. about that. Snowflakes. Yep. And not just those of us that think Trump is a traitor. Uh, seagulls. Foam. Exiting vehicles. It's my pet peeve. It's got to be all in or nothing. You can't have a combination of things out there screwing around with the uh, systems. Hills. Bridges. <laughs> Hills. <laughs> and yes, fucking shadows. Shadows oh. confuse self-driving cars. <laughs> oh, great. Fourteen and a half more years. Yes. Uh, Gwydion writes in. I'm sure you've seen the article. Listening to the radio this morning, I heard that Wisconsin is trying to pass legislation to allow these. Mixing winter weather, beer, and electric scooters should be fun. Uh, and this is a link over Gizmodo. Emergency rooms say people are getting really hurt on electric scooters. Uh, there's a 161% increase in scooter injuries from eight over a four-month time span in 2017 to 21 in that same time period this year in one particular hospital in Salt Lake City. So, yeah, of course, people are getting hurt on these things. It's crazy. They're getting more than hurt because Scott writes in, mm-hmm. fatalities, it's getting real now. Lime Scooters has its second fatality in a month. And guess what it's from? Head <sighs> trauma from not wearing a fucking helmet. Yes, Go and, uh, figure. And as much as I like to tout what uh, California in general is doing, and Santa Monica in particular, for things, I am not thrilled with uh, California Governor Jerry Brown, who just signed into law a bill eliminating the requirement for e-scooter riders to wear helmets. Okay. Why? Well, what the? guess uh, who pushed for it? Bird. Oh, my God. Jerry, Come what on, are you Jerry. doing? You're doing a lot of good things here. Don't screw this one up. I mean, you actually changed my opinion of you from all of the Dead Kennedy songs I listened to when I was a kid. <laughs> I thought I'd be moving here. And then, you know, Governor Jerry Brown is here. Oh, no, it's going to be terrible. And you've been great. But this is fucking dumb. Yes, it is. Uh, Seth writes in uh, about, uh, he sends us a link for a company called The Touch, which makes HB rings. This ring lets you feel your partner's heartbeat anywhere in the world in real time. And he asks, what happens if you die while they're checking your pulse? Which is Aww. sad. Yes, but is uh, sad. I thought you might like this, Jason. Created by a company called The Touch, HB rings allow you to feel your partner's heartbeat in real time, regardless of where they are in the world. A comfort that would certainly put my mind at ease. Uh, there are multiple benefits from, from, from daily physical contact. I'm not sure if having a ring on your finger when you're not around somebody that you love and it just like pulsates is really doing much. But I thought you could get one for two for your dogs and, and wear those rings. Kiss my ass. <laughs> Dick. <laughs> Uh, Fernando writes in, hey, guys, although Shopify does compete with Amazon, I think the point its CEO makes is still valid. Shopify doesn't compete with its own clients while Amazon does. Yeah, we agree with that. We agree with what the CEO was saying. I think the only point that Jason and I were both making is uh, you always have to keep in mind the person making the point. He does have a vested interest. Over on GOG.show, Martin writes in, guys, you talked about 23andMe in the past and law enforcement using that data. Do you think hardware vendors are passing on fingerprints or facial images, too? You guys are great. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I would. Uh, I haven't read the EULAs on any of that sort of stuff, but I'm sure that they own that data and are collecting it and probably would feel free selling it at some point. Mm, that's an interesting take. Yeah. yeah. Never even thought about that. Me either. And Peter writes in again and with the... In a, more stuff but uh he says in closing i would love it if you could talk a little bit about e-commerce solutions as you touched upon when bringing up shopify my boss wants me to work with magento to set up a store which if i recall the main difference being that magento is self-hosted as opposed to shopify doing the hosting themselves if you guys have any experience with magento please do share thank you as always i do i have set up several magento stores and if there is any way humanly possible that you can get around it don't 
do it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, just don't set up a Magento store. The problem there is you have to deal with credit card processing yourself unless you deal with somebody like yep. uh, Stripe. Uh, but for for everything about it, Magento mm. is just terrible to work with. It is a terrible CMS for shopping. Yep. Uh, set up a Shopify store. Seriously. Seriously. And honestly, there is no plus to doing the, the hosting yourself. Let Shopify None. do the hosting. Unless you're getting paid a lot of money to maintain a, maintain the server, especially in an e-commerce situation, that can be a lot of work. Let them do it. Yeah, when you have to get your server credit card certified, it takes forever. You know, if you're doing the, like the hosting yourself with that, because uh, what was that certification called when you host credit cards? Uh, I can't even remember anymore. It's been so long. Yeah, since I've, I set one up. I've wiped it from my memory <laughs> because it's such a horrible process. Yeah. I've done it like maybe a dozen times and every time it's miserable. So setting up a Magento shop, just dude, no, it's 2018. Move you should on. not be doing that yourself. <clears throat> yes. Move on. Uh, John writes us, this is a great article about the complete lack of security from this bike sharing company and how the author was able to dump a database of every user. Shouldn't this sort of laziness be criminal? And this is Cracking Drop Bike, Data Breach and Free Bike Rides. It's, it is an in-depth exactly how he broke into their system. And yeah, this kind of laziness should be illegal, but uh, you know, it isn't. And uh, well, as we always discuss in our security segment with Dr. Uh, doctor, with David doctor. Bittner, uh, there is <laughs> yeah. basically zero consequence for being a fuck up anymore. Well, GDPR is supposed to be taking care of this, but... I guess if if you're not selling bike rides in Europe, you're yep. shit out of luck. Yeah. So Zachary writes in, just heard about this site and thought you guys would get a kick out, kick out of it. <laughs> Let's blockchain all things. Yes, it's a social network on the blockchain called Peepeth. Yes, and every time I look at it, I see Peepath. Horrible name. Peepeth. I see Peepath. <laughs> I, I'm just going to start doing that with the dogs. Doggies, would you like to go out and go Peepeth? <laughs> yes. So this appears to be some sort of Twitter knockoff, except it's on the blockchain. Because blockchain. Because why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, my God. Over on iTunes, we have a five-star rating from Stress Technoid. My meager payment would have rated the show at four stars as I had to leave a snarky remark or comment. Consider a V score of four and a meat space score of five. Guess I will just have to go to the website. What is the address again? Of course. Of course. <laughs> and now this next one comes from TN TM Sendry. One star. How dare you? How dare you talk about James Franco in a rude way? Unsub! <laughs> um, so first I thought, I'm like, okay, well, James Franco obviously used to listen to the show, but doesn't anymore. But then I went and I looked at, because one of the things you can do in iTunes is you can actually see all of the previous reviews. This is a very cranky left. person. I did that too. <laughs> They're very cranky. Yes. Yeah. No. Maybe try some uh, meditation. Just yeah, chill. And, and you know what? Don't kill the messenger. And uh, did you also write the New York Times and every other news outlet that have said some things about James Franco that you consider rude? Said, we didn't do it. He did it. And I did say that he was decent in the one where he cut his arm off. Mm. You know, at least I gave him, gave him something. But Jesus oh, Christ. Christ. One star just because we don't like James Franco. God. <sighs> Tough crowd. If you want your question or comment read on the show, head over to GOG.show slash support and send us your feedback or questions that we can read on the air. And if you're so inclined, please head over to GOG.show slash iTunes and toss us a five star and snarky review, unless you're James Franco. Closing shout outs. My closing shout out this week goes to Paul Simon. He has played his farewell concert. He is not going to play anymore, which I didn't know until I heard about the show. <laughs> So <laughs> I am a huge I fan did not of know that. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Paul Simon and uh, Graceland is still on my playlist for when I go to work in the morning because I think it's one of the greatest albums ever made. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really sad that, that he's calling it calling it quits finally. Yeah, it is sad that he's calling it quits. And it's also sad that he just couldn't get his shit together with Garfunkel to do one song with him on his last show. Garfunkel actually like booked a show the same night. So you knew he wasn't coming there. Edie Burkell came out because they're married. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> so that's kind of a an easy one. But yeah, the fact that Garfunkel couldn't come and, you know, for his final show, that shows that that's some petty shit. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. 
It happens. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to our Patreon subscribers, patreon.com slash GOG. Thank you so much. We just crossed the 1K per month line. We really appreciate it, particularly since we're putting more and more of our precious little time into the show. And we're trying to figure out more and more of our downtime, as Jason always talks about. We originally wrote our goals back before, you know, reality. So we're going to reconvene and figure out what we can do. But to be fair, you are getting two shows a week now, bitches. So really, uh, that works out <laughs> yeah. to what? 125 bucks a show minus our costs. So Jason and I are basically clearing about a six pack per show nothing to sneeze at mind you better than most podcasts do definitely better than most so we do appreciate it very much but uh keep it coming come on keep it coming yes (laughs) until next time i'm jason defilippo and i'm brian schillmeister thanks for listening to grumpy old geeks support the show and keep us on the air go to patreon.com slash gog toss us a buck a month and we'll love you forever if you'd like to give a one-time or recurring donation go to gog.show and click on the paypal button in the sidebar Show notes for this episode are at GOG.show slash 284. From there, you can find links to old episodes, leave feedback, ask questions, and get links to stuff we like. Stay grumpy, and we'll see you in a few days. Granted, because I'm crazy, wearing these bags.